Let's now move on to address the topics of mass and weight. Your authors do a good job introducing you to the seven fundamental units used to measure seven fundamental quantities in physics from which all other measured quantities are derived. And we show that same table here. Early in this course, we'll mostly be concerned with length, time, mass, and temperature. And we'll introduce the others as we encounter them. For the moment, we're going to focus on mass. Your authors describe how that folks in the ancient world thought about the behavior of falling objects. For another take on this, we turn to a short video in which Brian Cox describes a similar phenomenon. You can watch this video for yourself if you follow this link. This is NASA's space power facility near Cleveland, Ohio, and it is the world's biggest vacuum chamber. It's used to test spacecraft in the conditions of outer space, and it does that by pumping out the 30 tons of air in this chamber until there are about two grams left. And it's kind of got an eccentric construction, which is part of its history. It was built in the 1960s as a nuclear test facility to test nuclear propulsion systems. And that meant that they built it out of aluminium to make the radiation easier to deal with. Aluminium is not the best thing, the strongest material to build a vacuum chamber out of. So they built an outer concrete skin, which is part radiation shielding and part an external pressure vessel. So that this thing can take the force that's present on the outside when it's pumped out to the conditions of outer space. Galileo's experiment was simple. He took a heavy object and a light one and dropped them at the same time to see which fell fastest. Now in this case, the feathers fell to the ground at a slower rate than the bowling ball because of air resistance. So in order to see the true nature of gravity, we have to remove the air. It takes three hours to pump out the 800,000 cubic feet of air from the chamber. Okay, we dropped two millitor in the last 30 minutes. But once it's complete, there's a near perfect vacuum inside. 6104 manual, 10% open. Station one, go for drop. PCB 30-1, pressure set point at 240 PSI. We are go for drop. 10, 9, 8, Seven, six, five, four, cameras on, two, one, release. Exactly. <laughs> they came down exactly the same. Wow. Look, look, look. That's right there. Look at how they hit right there. <laughs> exactly. You're back on the side. Of the exactly the same. Oh. Feathers don't move. Nothing. Look at that. That's just brilliant. Isaac Newton would say that the ball and the feather fall because there's a force pulling them down gravity. But Einstein imagined the scene very differently. The happiest thought of his life was this. The reason the bowling ball and the feather fall together is because they're not 
falling. They're standing still. There is no force acting on them at all. He reasoned that if you couldn't see the background, there'd be no way of knowing that the ball and the feathers were being accelerated towards the Earth. So he concluded they weren't. I don't know about you, but I thought that was pretty cool. We're going to come to define mass in a couple of ways. One, inertially, and the other, gravitationally. The good news is that for our purposes, these two quantities are numerically equal to each other, but they mean different things. First of all, inertial mass refers to the resistance of an object to changes in its velocity. The more massive the object is, the harder it is to change the object's motion. And this idea of mass is related to how the object responds to various forces. On the other hand, gravitational mass refers to the amount of substance an object contains. This concept is related to the amount of gravitational interaction between pairs of objects. The more massive an object is, the more gravitational force it will exert and it will feel. When we talk about the gravitational interaction between the Earth and an object, we refer to this gravitational force as the object's weight. Mass and weight are related to each other through the acceleration due to gravity. And we'll have much more to say about acceleration and gravity in later lessons. For now, we simply say that for positions that are close to the surface of the Earth, the acceleration due to gravity at the Earth, which we'll symbolize using the lowercase g, is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. And in problem solving in this course, we'll round this number off to about 10 meters per second squared. So, in equation form, it looks like this. The weight, which we'll say F with a subscript W, the force due to weight, is equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity, or FW is equal to M times G. The MKS unit of mass is the kilogram, the unit of acceleration is meters per second squared, and the unit of force is the newton, which is the equivalent of multiplying mass by acceleration. A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Here are a couple of numerical examples. We'll start with example 4.2. An object has a mass of 100 kilograms. What does the object weigh on Earth at sea level? We begin with what we know. We know this object has a mass of 100. We also recognize that when we're talking about Earth, that we'll use the acceleration due to Earth of 10 meters per second squared. What are we trying to find? We're trying to find the weight of the object. So we pull out our weight formula. The weight is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. We put in the numbers, 100 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared. And now 100 times 10 is 1,000, and the units are kilogram meters per second squared. But this combination of units, kilogram meters per second squared, is the same thing as a newton. So we would say that the weight is 1,000 newtons. And there's our answer. Example 4.3. The weight of an object is 475 newtons. What is the mass of the object? We begin with what we know. We know what the weight of the object is. We know what g is. For the Earth, that's 10 meters per second squared. We have a relationship between those. Weight is equal to m times g. We're looking for m. So we divide both sides by g in order to get m. We put in the numbers, and then we put those numbers into our calculator. Though in this case, when we have tens, that's very nice. We just move the decimal place, and we get 47.5 in a newton per meter per second squared is a kilogram. The mass of this object is 47.5 kilograms. Finally, we turn our attention to density. Density is related to how closely matter is compacted, and numerically, it's defined to be density equals mass divided by volume. You learned this in chemistry. We symbolize density using the lowercase Greek letter rho, which is the equivalent of our r. It looks like the letter P in the Roman alphabet, but it's not. 
Symbolically, we would write the density formula as density is equal to mass divided by volume, and that will be an important equation for us. Your authors list densities of some selected substances. We'll deal with densities of solids, liquids, and gases as the course progresses. I think it's interesting to notice that were you to place a lead brick in a tub of mercury, the lead brick would float because the density of lead is less than the density of mercury. Lead has a density of 11,300 kilograms per cubic meter. Mercury has a density of 13,600 kilograms per cubic meter. And so we would see that the lead would float in mercury. I would not suggest trying this at home. Let's work the next example. Example 4.4. A block of copper weighs 4650 newtons. What is the volume of the block? We're given here the weight of copper. That weight is 4650 newtons. But we're looking for volume. If I knew what the mass of this copper was, then I could relate that mass through the density and the volume in the density formula. So I'm going to have to combine two equations together. The equation for weight, the weight is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity, and the density equation. Density is mass per volume. I'm looking for the volume. Let's put those equations together. Let's solve for the mass. The mass is the weight divided by the acceleration due to gravity, the 4650 newtons divided by 10 meters per second squared, and we get that the mass of this copper is 465 kilograms. Now we want to know what the volume is. The density formula tells us that the volume is equal to the mass divided by the density. If I knew what the copper was, which is a number that I can look up in this table, it's 8,920 kilograms per cubic meter, then I could use that with the mass that I found in the previous part of the problem. So let's put these things together. The mass is 465 kilograms. The density from the table is 8,920 kilograms per cubic meter. Now let's pay attention to the units. I have kilograms upstairs and a kilogram per cubic meter downstairs. I have one over meters cubed downstairs, which is going to become meters cubed upstairs. And now I put in the numbers. And I find that the volume of this particular amount of copper is 0.05 cubic meters. So let's review what we did in this lesson. We introduced the idea of reference frames and the concept of relativity. We have talked about the difference between distance and speed versus displacement and velocity. And we've solved a problem involving vectors. And we've discussed mass, weight, and density. For now, that's it.